get Kyla back on the piano. You know, she comes with her own band and everything. Put your hands together for our sister Kyla and the work. She and our sister Henry and Young with our young ladies, and so blessed to have them. You know, I miss them when they're not here. We didn't have them uh, last Thursday, Sunday, but they're here today, amen? I want to share this with you. I will pass this on to our scholarship committee. It's getting time for our uh, scholarship. We have um, a hundred dollar assessment that we have to make uh, each year to be uh, participants. Um, with their busy schedule, they're continuing to make activities and plans. Um, during the uh, association, uh, Lady Bryant, uh, who leads the scholarship, the Reverend Dr. H. Percy Scholarship um, for uh, the New Hope Association uh, got this information uh, to me, and I would be remiss not to make sure that we get this application to our scholarship committee and can share with our young people. I believe we have two graduates this year, and we want them to be in the running. Amen? Amen. Uh, the applications uh, will be available up to April 17th, and they must be returned by June 5th, 2020. The reason why they have to be returned by June 5th, June 5th, 2020, because on Saturday, June 20th, 2020, at 12 p.m., the tickets are $40. The guest speaker, Dr. Gwendolyn Platt. Woo! Let's go on to the Now, I should feel some kind of way because my wife is getting more calls than me. Nobody paying $40 to hear me. But we're going to pass this on to our scholarship committee. One of our scholarship committee people give this to our scholarship president. And you all can share with that and we can get those flyers out. Amen? I'm actually not jealous. I just laughed at my wife's chat. She's learned to appreciate what it takes to prepare to bring a message. Amen. She just thought I opened up the Bible and came up with something. No, she is studying and studying and studying. And we thank God that he has given her the ability to do that. And we're going to give her a rest because we don't want to put her to too much work. So we're going to rest her on some occasions. But we believe that God is using her for times such as this. Amen. If you would, there's a word from the Lord and we want you to open up to the book of Matthew. 10th chapter of Matthew, in fact. Open up your Bibles. If you do not have a Bible, there's one in the pew. Uh, if there's none in the pew and you have a phone, just Google Matthew 10, verses 16 through 20. And you'll be surprised that you have a Bible when you don't know you have a Bible. Amen. No excuses. Look at your name and say, no excuses. Word is there for us. If you would, when you find it, we ask that you would stand in reference to the reading of the Word of God. Matthew 10. We'll be reading verses 16 through 20. I'll be reading from the New International Version. And the Word of the Lord reads, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will, be, it will not be you speaking but the spirit of your father speaking through you. And the word of the Lord is blessed. As you remain standing, I come to preach to the subject. Let's go get it. Let us pray. Turn God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, we're prepared now for what you called us to do. We take this responsibility not lightly. Oh God, we come to stand before your people. But in our standing, we ask that you would stand up and sit me down, hide me behind your cross. Allow what I say and what comes to mind be the word that you have given for your people for a time such as this. 
Let this word be a lamp unto their feet, a light unto their path. God, let this word guide them in a time such as this. Motivate them to bring people closer to Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in his presence. The Lord gave me this simple mission lesson last Sunday as I sat at the pulpit and looked out, saw some empty pews as I walked to the pulpit and didn't realize what the Lord was saying to me and what was about to happen. I had no idea that the sports and entertainment world would be shut down. I mean, shut down completely. Anytime on the back of the popular newspaper in New York, New York Post, where it says the day sports world was shut down. Makes you think in terms of what is really important to us. It's ironic that I will say to you last Sunday that my message will be, let's go get them. This month is a month that I used to long for going into the next month. Because of being a basketball fanatic, I would have games and everything on TV. And we would have something called March Madness. But March Madness has come in a very different way. And we as believers have to make the best of this moment. What do you mean, Pastor? Yeah, we have to make the best of this moment. And this is sometimes a moment in which we're down, and which is our strongest moment. Some people will know what I'm talking about. If you ever did a little martial arts, you would understand that the downward position sometimes it's the most powerful position because of reaching up and, and, and fighting up, bringing power to you. So yeah, I come to say, let's go get him. I'm a coach, former coach. You know, sports coaches, you know, might give their team a pep talk and say, let's go get them. And that just means do your best by defeating the opposing enemy. And I come to tell you, when you leave here and we depart the serve, and somebody said, well, I know it was rough. How was church? You say, church was good, and I'm coming to get you. Yeah. If you want me, I'm coming to get you. I'm coming to get you, and I'm coming to get somebody else. Because this is the time when we have to go get them. You all know. Some of you business people, sales managers, tell your sales people, let's go get them. Let's, let's go get that deal. Let's go get that insurance or policy. Let's go get those sales. You know, it's the same mindset. I used to encourage my faculty staff. Let's go get them. Let's go get those students. Let's go get the ones who don't come to school. Let's go get the ones who are failing. Let's go get the ones who have a need. And let me tell you something. We have people out there now who have a need because they have had their most precious self-encouragement, excitement taken away from them. What are they going to do? They can't blame it on sports anymore because there's only reruns on TV. What excuse are they going to make? Now is the time to go get them. Jesus is in the position of a coach and manager. And he is challenging his disciples to get ready for some hard work that is going to be meaningful work in building the kingdom here on earth. Yeah, that's what this text is talking about. He's challenging them, you know. And, and I, you, I took you to, you know, verses 16 through 20, but if you really study and you want to really execute the text and you really want to give some history and some background, you got to go back. You have to go back. And when you go back prior to chapter 10, Jesus has been hard at work. Some of y'all might know this if you have to read your Bible, but he used his authority to forgive and heal a paralytic man and was accused of blasphemy. He recruited Matthew to become one of his disciples, and Matthew began to follow him. This is the work he was doing. The Pharisees criticized Jesus' disciples and accused him of not keeping the law because they wasn't fasting like him. Jesus had to tell them 
Oh, there's going to come a time. They'll be ready to fast. Don't you worry about that. Jesus moved on and he raises a girl from the dead. I'm, I'm talking to somebody about the Bible. Do we believe the Bible? This is the stuff that Jesus is the one we believe in. He also healed a sick woman who touched the hem of his garment who had been bleeding for 12 years. He healed some blind men because of their faith. And Jesus told them not to tell anyone that they went, told them not to tell anyone what he did. He didn't heal them and tell them to go tell them, but he told them not to tell them. You know, sometimes when you tell somebody not to tell something, what do they do? They go and tell anyway. So they went and told everybody in the region about what he did. And then Jesus amazes a crowd of people by healing a mute man and getting him to talk. They were so amazed at telling people about Jesus because the demon was driven out of the man. That demon is what made the man mute. They said, nothing like this has ever happened, has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, nah, it is, the, it is by the prince of demons that Jesus drives out demons. See, because they didn't want people to embrace the power and the authority that Jesus possessed. But I came today to let somebody know that we still have some Pharisees today who still feel the same way in our current crisis. We have to let them know that we as believers, regardless of what comes our way, we are believers, we are believers now, and we're gonna be believers as long as we live. I don't know about you, but I was a believer when the Ebola crisis came. I was a believer when the swine flu crisis came. And I don't know about you, I'm gonna be a believer through this crisis. Jesus sent his disciples out to deal with the issues the way he dealt with the issues, the way he did then. And he wants us to go out and deal with the crisis now. We can't be flooded by a leadership who just wants to shake hands with people and say tremendous jobs, who wants to go on TV and just bring a bunch of uh, businessmen together and make it look like he's doing well. Then get in then get into an argument with a news reporter because the truth of the matter is we really wouldn't be here if he had not eliminated the CDC when he came into presidency. Come on, come on. Then he wants to put out misinformation to tell somebody about what the other, other uh, administration did when it came to the swine flu. And he didn't even have the correct numbers. We got to be careful about the rhetoric. And we have to be careful about focusing on him. Because he is going to do what he's going to do. But guess what? God is going to do something better. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew that the harvest is ripe. Anybody remember this scripture? But the laborers are few. He is still challenging us because the harvest is ripe today. And we need to go out and we need to get the lost. We need to go out. And we need to get to this, those who are in despair. We need to go out and we need to let them know that there is some hope during this time. Amen? Amen. I'm excited. I was counting 25 people. I can't even count how many is here today. I'm excited because, hey, maybe some things have to happen for people to be here. But guess what? If you're here, you need to get excited about the God that you serve. Amen. I got my three points and I'll be done. First point is we need to seize the moment. We are facing a time that is like none other. The coronavirus known as COVID-19 is going to get worse before things get better. And here's my question. Will those who chose sports over church now choose church because there's no sports? Well, some of y'all will get that when you get home. We have to seize the moment and encourage people in our community. We got to seize the moment and encourage our friends. We got to seize the moment and encourage people in our family. We got to seize the moment and encourage those who do not know about God. Don't you know that there's some people in your family who are going crazy because of what's happening right now? And you need to tell them you need to stop the madness and start trusting in God. We trust, we, we trust ourselves more than we trust God. And now that we can't trust ourselves, uh, we are concerned because there's something going around that we can't see. But 
but I come to tell somebody, yeah, there's something going around that you can't see, uh, and that something going around has kept me, uh, that has kept me, uh, and has kept me, uh, and has blessed me, and it has taken me from one level to the next, uh, and got me a job when I needed a job, uh, and got me money when I needed money, uh, it gave me a house when I needed a home to live in, uh, it gave me a car, what is that? That something is the power of God. And you can't see that either. Because see, people want to use that argument. You're serving a God that you can't see. Well, you're scared of a virus that you can't see. Yeah. See, this is the best time. You got to seize the moment. You got to tell them, come on out of the house. Well, I'm not going out because it ain't going to make a difference. Well, you need to try it and see. Try coming to church. Try coming to worship. Try being in the house of God. And you never know what we've been struggling with. It might not take six months. It might just take three months. Or it might just take three weeks. We may get a breakthrough that we didn't expect. But you never know until you try. Look at your neighbors and seize the moment. Let's go get them. Seize the moment. And tell somebody about how good God has been to you. Tell some, because see, some of us are going to know somebody who got the virus. But you're going to realize that, that they may have gotten it and you didn't get it. And you need to lift your hands and thank God that he is keeping you. Number two, we got to trust. We got to promote trust in God. That's when we need to learn that trusting the Lord comes down to acknowledging that we do not have all the answers. Amen, somebody. Because sometimes we get so religious, we act like we got all the answers. No, you don't need to act like you have all the answers. All you have to do is tell them that Christ is the answer. I remember seeing those big red buttons at, uh, at deliverance and the folk used to wear them all the time. Uh, uh, Clarkson, though, because he used to be in church uh, trying to play the organ with the big boys. Uh, and they used to be all walking around. Remember that Christ is the answer. That's what we got to start telling people that Christ is the answer. And it is your trust in him. We need to trust him and submit our ways to him even when it doesn't make sense. And this is a time when in what? It doesn't make sense. We can wipe our nose. We can sneeze in the tissue. We can cough in the tissue. We can all wear gloves. We can all sanitize all while we're here. We can sanitize from the front to the back. But if you do not have God in your heart, it will not make a difference. We got to trust God. The Bible gives us good examples. Do you remember God instructed Joshua, for instance, to march around a well-fortified city of Jericho a number of times so that it would fall and it would fall into his hands? And do, do you think that people believe that? But no, you go back to Joshua 6, 1 through 10. No, they didn't believe it because it didn't make sense. Logically, it seemed like it did not make a whole lot of sense to do that. But Joshua trusted God, and he made the choice to obey his command. And guess what? Jericho, what happened to it? It fell exactly as God said it would. Solomon, who was considered one of the wisest men to have ever lived, he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will what? He will direct your paths. I found myself in many situations that required me to apply that verse, and God has never, ever failed me. Has anybody been there? Have you had to trust in God when life has devastated you? Have you ever had to trust in God when you lost your loved one? Have you ever had to trust in God? And we're talking about this virus, so let's think it. Maybe I'll hit you medically. Have you ever had to trust in God when you had a diagnosis uh, that the doctor was still scratching his head about? Have you ever had to trust God when you had to walk in the midst of your ailment uh, and God didn't just take it away? Uh, have you ever had to trust God when you know you have a condition and you're not telling nobody about it, but he keeps making a way out of nowhere every day? Let, let me tell you, I, I shared my, my, my testimony and I've been very transparent with you and told you after I retired, I was going through so much 
and, and, and retired at a time where I, I know I had a good 10 more years in me. In fact, right now, I still believe I got another 10 more years in me. I can still, I, in fact, I can principle better than some principles from my cell phone. When I see what's going on now. So I, I know I still could go in and do a better job than most people. But I was a heart attack waiting to happen. Numbers was off the chart. A1C was a nine point plus. Trying to deal with the, the taking care of my mother and being a good husband, good father, and, and dealing with the, the, the regular challenges in life. And even though I looked good on the outside, I was going through on the inside. But after I left and started working on that, the next thing I knew, I had been going to an oncologist with my mother week after week, month after month, for about two years. And then my doctor would write a note that I would go to visit him and say, you have to see this doctor. Didn't think nothing about it, thought it was just another, you know, dietitian somebody go to to make sure my, my H2 diet, my type 2 diabetes is in place or whatever. Got to the doctor's office and they say, oncologist. Now, can you trust God when you get sent to an oncologist? Because everybody knows when you start talking oncology that you're talking cancer. Oncologists took my blood levels and my white blood cells were less than what they should have been. In fact, she was so confused that she had to go do her research. She can't be no more than about 29 or 30 years old, but she's a phenomenal doctor. And she said, we got to watch this because your blood cells are so weak that any kind of ailment that come that way, you don't have the agents to fight against it. So you're going to be susceptible to anything that comes. So very quietly, I think I was going to her week after week, bi-weekly, two weeks, two months. And then she would put me off. And then she finally put me on a, 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 another a vitamin that, that would help me. And the blood count that was just one point something. It, it should have been four plus. It was one point something. For two years, just hovered around that. And I would just have to go back and forth. And so then she would put me off. And finally, finally, just last year, it got over too. And she said, it looks a little bit better, so I'll see you every three months. I went to the doctor's office Monday after having cancer, the, the, the office having strep throat and all of that. And I went in Monday and, and, and went in first and they took my blood pressure. And my blood pressure was 150 over 90. And I began to get concerned. So my wife called it white coat syndrome. And so, and, you know, when you go to the doctor, your blood pressure just goes up. So I went up to her, and I started joking with her. I said, downstairs, my blood pressure was 120 over 80. When I came up to you, it was 150 over 90. So she just laughed. And she looked at the chart, and she said, is this you? I said, it's my chart. I took my blood. And she said, this is you? She said, I don't need to see you for another six months. I said, why? She said, your blood count is 4.5. And it hasn't been that for two years. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying and I'm preaching and I'm trusting God. I would love to tell you that there was something great that I did. I would love to give you some kind of situation that I had got healthy and did whatever. But all I know is that I just trusted God that he would handle what I couldn't handle. When you trust God and you find yourself in those situations, you've got to be able to say, God, I give you glory. I come to That's why God doesn't tell us everything. 
and telling us the worst, we can meet his service. And so sometimes some stuff just has to show up. You know, we, we, we find ourselves uh, being persecuted. And I come to tell you, persecutors are worse than beasts in that they prey upon those of their own kind. The strongest bonds of love and duty have often been broken through the form of enmity against Christ. The people who you know, the people who are in your family, the people who call you friends are sometimes the greatest perpetrators, but you still have to say, expect a miracle. Regardless of whether your family is living right or doing what they're supposed to do, you have to say, expect a miracle. I just had a conversation, a great intimate talk with our uh, DMAC, our Director of Music, Arts, and Cultural Program, and I'm talking about expecting a miracle. We can't just continue to go on. I said in 10 years, we got to have some changes. We got to have some young people who are going to take our place. We got to have some younger people who are going to be in the leadership. We got to have some young people who are going to take over. I don't know about you, but I expect a miracle that God is going to send those people. <laughs> Sufferings from friends and relations are very grievous. Uh, nothing cuts more. It appears plainly that all who will live godly in Christ Jesus must suffer. We will suffer. Why will we suffer? Because Christ suffered. Does he want us to suffer? No. But we suffer out of the fact of our own disobedience in most cases. But that's okay. We have to understand that the strongest bonds of love and duty have often broken through the enmity against Christ. Suffering uh, is not something that will last always. Look at your neighbor and say, it won't last always. Trouble uh, won't last always. Uh, it appears plainly that all who will live godly for Christ will suffer, but it won't last always. As disciples of Christ, this text shares that we need to have a serpent's wisdom. We must think more of how to do well than speak well. I'm talking to somebody. Uh, we must think of more of how we should do well than speak well because God will give us what to say. When challenges come, like the challenges we have today, the disciples of Christ can avoid danger, but we still must complete our duty to God. What is our duty to God? Our duty to God is to feed his sheep. And how do we feed the sheep? We got to go out and get them. Do you see them here? No. So every pew, when you look at every pew here, every empty pew, you should say, that's how many people I need to talk to this week. That's how many people I need to tell about the goodness of God. That's how many people I need to let them know that I have not been given the spirit of fear, but I've been given the spirit of love and sound mind. Do I have any witnesses here? The fear of man brings a stare that disturbs our peace, that causes us to be drawn into sin. And we have to pray against every sin. We have to pray against every attack of the enemy. I, I spent time this morning, I put a note on my door. I spent time going into prayer because if I don't pray, how can I tell you to pray? And sometimes we just got to take some time and we have to get on our knees or sit on our rusty dusty or get into our prayer closet and spend some time praying to God. When is the last time that you prayed to God for his power to meet your need? When is the last time that you've gone to God? I know you complained about it. I know you talked about it. But when is the last time you really spent 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes in prayer and just believed that God was going to make a way out of nowhere? We've got to tell people to expect a miracle in these times because tribulation, distress, and persecution cannot take away God's love for them. You have to tell them uh, that this virus is not going to take away God's love for you because in my Bible, if you go to Romans, it tells you uh, that nothing uh, shall separate me uh, from the love of God. Uh, this should silence all of their fears uh, of God, all of the fears that they have of everything that's coming their way. And God's people will prevail. It's our duty not only to believe in Christ, uh, but to profess Christ. Anybody here professing Christ? Anybody here telling somebody at work? Uh, I don't know what you do. Uh, I know we say at church, I don't know what you come to do, but I came to praise the Lord. You need to start saying at work. I don't know why you came today, uh, but 
and let thee bless me that when I want to take off, I can take off. Because he blessed me to have the time to do it. Am I talking to anybody? Christ will lead us through all the sufferings, giving glory to him. That's why we can expect a miracle. Anybody here can expect a miracle? I don't know about you, but I expect a miracle. I used to play with the Clark sisters, and one of the hottest songs was Expect a Miracle. And Twinkie would get up on the piano, and she would start playing Expect a Miracle. I expect a miracle every day, not just on Sunday, but every day. I expect a miracle. I expect the impossible. I believe the intangible. I believe that God will make a way. Well, maybe some of you don't know about that song. Christ still leaves us. It was another writer who, who wrote a song, and it said, In times like these, we need a Savior. Am I talking to anybody? In times like these, we need an anchor. Be very sure. Am I talking to anybody? Be very sure. Be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Who is the rock? That rock is Jesus. I'm gripping on to him. And every doctor's visit, I'm gripping on to him. If I get a fever, I'm gripping on to him. If I get a cough, I'm gripping on to him. If I don't feel well, because I am sure that my anchor holds. It also says, in times like these, you need a Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle, but be very sure. Be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid, the solid rock. What's that rock? Somebody tell me. What's his name? What's his name? Yeah. 
But we do the things that will make us safe in the, in the land that we're living in. That we obey the laws of the land. Yeah. And that we be diligent in telling people about the Jesus who will save us from it all. Yeah. Oh God, it's not by happenstance that this challenge comes on Lent season. While we are fasting and praying and believing for our high holy day, Resurrection Sunday. God, just as I believe that you rose on that Sunday morning, I believe you'll rise in this situation and we'll leave here stronger than we were when we came. Now unto him who's able to keep us faultless before his throne, to the all-wise God, his majesty, his power, his dominion, may his peace which passes all understanding, God, our hearts and minds, lead us closer and closer to Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory is mine.